okay so we are discussing about the chapter of uh, breathing and exchange of gases in this chapter we'll be discussing about the mechanism of breathing uh, the different processes of exchange of gases majorly it is by diffusion then we are also going to discuss about the transport of gases apart from that we will also discuss the respiratory disorders in this chapter so it is a summary of this entire chapter so breathing and exchange of gases so what we'll begin with is the first uh, slide where the definition of respiration see in the backdrop of this slide you can see that there is a a uh, shark and a man so man with a diving suit so he has this diver suit with connection to oxygen so uh, and he is able to dive into the ocean so now uh, the fishes they are normally breathing in water whereas for a terrestrial animal like man he requires oxygen to be provided he can't breathe in water so there's a difference in the breathing mechanism in the aquatic life as well as the terrestrial life so that it brings about okay and if you remove a fish out of water so it it is going to suffocate so the respiratory organ in the fish is the gills whereas in human beings it is lungs so a lot of such differences are showcased in this slide so what is the exact purpose of respiration so respiration is the oxidation of nutrients in the living cells to release energy for all our biological work so respiration is the oxidation of nutrients when we are talking about nutrients it would be the uh, carbohydrates protein fats in the living cells to release energy for biological work see when i am speaking with you or explaining so i require energy and that require requirement of energy is obtained by the process of uh, oxidation of nutrients during respiration so that is how uh, we have energy for it so i have energy for giving you a session you are listening to me even there there is some expenditure of energy and for that you require the uh, you require uh, <clears throat> atp and that is obtained by oxidation of nutrients so that is what is the purpose of respiration respiration is the oxidation of nutrients within the living cells so that they can release energy for all the biological activities or the biological work so breathing is the exchange of oxygen from the atmosphere with the uh, carbon dioxide produced by the cells so it is exchange of oxygen from the atmosphere with what is it exchanging with carbon dioxide produced by the cells so breathing it's an exchange it's like a barter system so breathing is exchange of oxygen from the atmosphere with carbon dioxide produced by the cells so the respiratory organs in different organisms they differ so general body surface is the uh, respiratory system in case of these animals so the sponges uh, then you can notice this jellyfish uh, the uh, planaria in case of this flatworms so all of them throughout their entire body surface there is respiration by diffusion so general body surface uh, by diffusion they undergo respiration in case of lower invertebrates like sponges coelenterates flatworms it is directly by diffusion they don't have any special respiratory system or respiratory organ it is directly by diffusion through the general body surface that they breathe in case of these organisms okay so what are the respiratory organs so the skin or moist cuticle so they are also the uh, respiratory organ in case of certain organism we call it as cutaneous respiration you can notice this in earthworm the scientific name is ferritima uh, then you also notice it in leech and in toad so the amphibians also you can notice this uh, respiration by moist or cuticle 
uh, respiration skin or moist cuticle so the outermost uh, layer is responsible for the respiration so they have the respiration through the skin or the moist cuticle layer so they are going to help them in respiration so the example for these are earthworms leech amphibians they are all the examples for this uh, animals with having skin or moist cuticle for respiration so this you can notice in case of earthworm leech which belongs to annelida earthworm and leech belong to annelida then there is also the toad which belongs to amphibians so they exhibit uh, respiration through their skin or through their moist cuticle so we call this as cutaneous respiration examples are earthworms leech amphibians the respiratory organs are uh, in case of insects you find this trachea tracheal tubes are there see even we have the windpipe as trachea we call it as so this term is commonly used even in case of uh, the insects so they have a tracheal system in case of arthropods so example insects centipede uh, then millipede spider they exhibit this tracheal system so the insects locus so which were a menace very recently okay they all have this uh, tracheal system of respiration so the insects centipede millipede and spider they are all having this tracheal system of uh, respiration so the respiratory organs in case of fishes so the gills or uh, bran uh, branchial respiration we call it as so the gills are the respiratory organs in case of fishes tadpoles tadpoles have external gills okay and prawn prawn also has gills so in case of this aquatic animals like fishes tadpoles the young ones of amphibians they have this external gills so uh, internally the fishes have gills which are protected by this operculum they have this covering on them so the operculum is there which protects them so within that operculum when you open it you can notice this gills in case of fishes so external gills in case of tadpoles even prawns have gills so this is the branchial respiration so general body surface uh, skin or moist cuticle uh, that is uh, cutaneous respiration gills if respiration is by gills we call it as branchial respiration then we also have the uh, respiration from lungs that is the pulmonary respiration so in case of mammals like man cat others so most of the vertebrates they have the lungs as the respiratory uh, organ so the pulmonary respiration we also call it as example is vertebrates most of the vertebrates they have this lungs or pulmonary respiration now let us discuss about the human respiratory system see the human respiratory system it is of uh, we can study it under air tract or air passage and paired lungs so human respiratory system we can study it as the air tract or air passage and paired lungs so we are going to study about that so you were asking me about the diagram part of it the lungs they might ask you the uh, diagram of it later when i come to that diagram i'll just tell you about it so human respiratory system can be studied under two headings that is air tract or air passage and a paired lungs so what is this air pact air passage or air tract consists of they consists of the conducting part so it transports atmospheric air into the alveoli so the conducting part is what we call it as air passage or air tract it transports atmospheric air into the alveoli it clears the air from foreign particles so the conducting part so the nasal tract they'll be having this hair nasal hairs as well as mucus so they clear the air from foreign particles the air is also humidifies it humidifies and brings the uh, air to body temperature that is also being done by this conducting part so the air passage or air tract 
so which is the conducting part the following things happen it transports atmospheric air into the alveoli it clears the air from foreign particles it humidifies and brings the air to the body temperature so the air passage or air tract it begins from the external nostrils it leads to nasal passage nasal passage leads to nasal cavity or nasal chamber chamber we call it as and from the nasal cavity it leads to nasopharynx so and glottis so nasopharynx and glottis so further it leads to larynx from larynx it proceeds to this trachea from trachea they are going to enter into the primary bronchi and primary bronchi branches to form secondary bronchi and uh, tertiary bronchi then bronchioles and terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchiole so finally it leads to alveolar duct so each terminal bronchiole gives rise to many thin and vascularized sac like structures called as alveoli so this is the air passage or air tract okay so the external nostrils leads to nasal passage nasal passage leads to the nasal chamber or it is also called as nasal cavity nasopharynx leads to glottis so from the glottis it leads to larynx larynx is the uh, a voice box i told you about from the larynx it leads to the trachea and from trachea they are going to branch into primary bronchi Uh, the trachea enters into the right and left lung so they are going to branch to form the primary bronchi and enter into the right and left lung primary bronchi branches to form secondary bronchus and secondary bronchus branches to form tertiary bronchus so the tertiary bronchus they are going to branch to form the bronchioles you can notice all this in this structure so the bronchioles finally end up with terminal bronchiole and terminal bronchiole has the respiratory bronchioles through which diffusion of air takes place and the respiratory bronchiole it opens into the alveolar duct so each terminal bronchiole gives rise to many thin and vascularized alveoli so this is what you can notice in case of uh, the air tract or air passage so in human respiratory uh, system air passage or air tract the larynx or sound box or voice box is a cartilaginous box which helps in sound production so the larynx is also called as sound box or voice box so they are going to produce this uh, so it's a cartilaginous box which helps in production of sound so next time you know singing and other things just remember you have fine tuned your larynx for these different roles so during swallowing what is going to happen is the glottis is closed by this cartilaginous flap so this is elastic cartilaginous flap so that we call it as uh the epiglottis okay so epiglottis is going to uh, prevent the entry of food into larynx so the trachea all bronchi and initial bronchioles are separated by are supported by the c shaped cartilaginous rings or you can also call it as cartilaginous half rings so they are supported by so the human respiratory system you can notice that so the uh, from the nasal passage it leads to the larynx larynx or sound box or voice box we call it as it is a cartilaginous box which helps in the uh, pro sound production okay so the larynx further leads into glottis so the glottis is closed by epiglottis a thin elastic cartilaginous flap to prevent the 
entry of foot into larynx. I told you that many times some of the foot particles might enter into your nasal tract when you have swallowed the food before the epiglottis could close. Uh, the, the food might have entered into the nasal tract. So still you cough out of it, the irritation in your nasal tract, it continues. Okay, so the glottis is generally it is like a reflex action when you swallow your food. So the glottis is closed by this epiglottis, which is a thin elastic cartilaginous flap. So the epiglottis closes the glottis and prevents the entry of food into larynx. So the trachea, all the bronchi and initial bronchioles, they are all supported by incomplete cartilaginous half rings. So C-shaped cartilaginous rings, you can also call it as, or incomplete cartilaginous half rings. Just assume this cartilaginous half rings, if they were not there, what, it, what would it lead to? So it would lead to uh, the collapse of all this uh, trachea, the bronchi, and initial bronchus, they would all be collapsing. Without this cartilaginous half rings, the trachea, the bronchi, and initial bronchioles, uh, which are supported by this incomplete cartilaginous half rings, they are going to collapse. So the, uh, that is what happens if they do not have this incomplete cartilaginous half rings. So lungs, where are they situated? See, lungs are situated in the thoracic chamber and they rest on a diaphragm. You can see this red structure. So lungs are situated within the thoracic chamber and outside you find the rib cage. So they are located within the thoracic chamber and they are resting on the diaphragm. Okay, so right lung has three lobes. I told you that you can remember it as R3 or R3 or you can remember it as RT, RT. Okay, left lung has two lobes. So uh, L2 or L square, you can remember it as. So the left lung has two lobes, R3. The right lung has three lobes. So the each lung is covered by a double membrane pleura. So this pleura membrane, you can see the outer parietal pleura and inner visceral pleura. So they are having this pleural membrane an outer parietal pleura and an inner visceral pleura. This pleura is going to uh, cover the uh, double, this double layered pleura is covering the lungs. Okay, the pleural fluid present in between these two layers that is outer parietal pleura and inner visceral pleura, there is a space and that is filled by this pleural fluid. So the pleural fluid present in between these two layers, they lubricate the surface of the lungs and they prevent friction between the membranes. So they prevent the friction between the membranes. So that is the role of this pleural uh, fluid. See lungs, you have to draw this diagram and then expand it. So in your textbook, there is a, a diagram of lungs with this expansion of this bronchioles and other things. Please, uh, if they ask you a neat label diagram of lung with labeling, you have to explain that, okay? So the uh, lungs equals, what is the lungs made up of? They are outermost layer, they are made up of pleura. They have two membrane, outer parietal pleura and inner visceral pleura. In between these two layers, so there is a pleural fluid. So the pleural fluid present in between these two layers, they lubricate the surface of the lungs and they also prevent friction between the membranes, okay? So the lungs equals bronchi plus bronchioles plus alveoli. That is what majorly they are composed of, bronchi plus bronchioles plus alveoli. So the alveoli and their ducts, they are going to form respiratory or exchange part of respiratory system. So the alveoli and their ducts, so that is the uh, respiratory bronchiole, then they would lead to terminal bronchioles. So they are going to form the respiratory or exchange part of respiratory system. And what is the structural and functional unit of lungs? Alveoli is the structural and functional unit of lungs. 
Now we'll discuss about different steps involved in respiration. So there are pulmonary uh, ventilation, or we also call it as breathing, gaseous exchange between lung, alveoli, and blood, between lungs and alveoli, and blood and tissues, the blood capillaries and tissues, the gaseous transport, that is oxygen transport and carbon dioxide transport, and the gaseous exchange between blood and tissues. Okay, so the gas transport, oxygen transport and carbon dioxide transport. Then there is gas exchange between blood and tissues. Finally, there is cellular or tissue respiration. So which we are not going to study, but in plants, we have already studied this. Glycolysis, Krebs cycle, terminal oxidation. That is what is going to take place even in human being, the cellular or tissue respiration. So even in human beings, the glycolysis takes place within the cytoplasm of the cell. The Krebs cycle takes place within the matrix of the mitochondria. The terminal oxidation or electron transport system, it takes place on the inner membrane of cristae of mitochondria. So the cellular oxidation or tissue respiration, uh, we have already discussed the steps in the plant respiration. So there won't be any elaboration on that, but these things will be discussed in detail. The pulmonary ventilation, breathing, okay, the exchange of gases uh, from, uh, the exchange of gas for, uh, that is oxygen from atmosphere with uh, carbon dioxide from the cells. So this exchange of gases, we call it as pulmonary ventilation or breathing. You should remember the another name for breathing is pulmonary ventilation. And there is a gaseous exchange between lung alveoli and lung alveoli and blood. So there is also a transport of gases that is transport of oxygen and transport of carbon dioxide, we'll also be studying about that. Uh, then gaseous exchange between blood and tissues. So these are the various steps of respiration. Final step is cellular respiration or tissue respiration. You can also call it a cellular oxidation. So first part of it that we will be discussing is mechanism of breathing. During inspiration or inhalation, what are the things that are going to take place? Uh, changes within the uh, lungs, the, the intercostal muscles, the rib cage, and the diaphragm. Similarly, we are also going to study the mechanism involved during expiration. So that is our exhalation. So inspiration is active intake of air from atmosphere into lungs. The intake of air from atmosphere into lungs, we call it as inspiration. So the expiration is expelling of air from the lungs to the atmosphere, we call it as expiration. So inspiration is intake of air from atmosphere to the lungs. Expiration is expelling of air from the lungs to the atmosphere. So we call this as the breathing part of it. Breathing is also called as pulmonary ventilation. So we'll be studying the mechanism of inspiration and mechanism of expiration and the changes that is going to take place within our body during this inspiration and expiration. So inspiration, inspiration, what is exactly going to happen during inspiration is the diaphragm contracts, that is it becomes flat or straight, okay? The diaphragm contracts or flattens. The second step is the vertical volume. So you can notice this vertical volume. So they are going to increase, the vertical volume is going to increase. That is from the anterior to the posterior region this volume increases, okay? So during this process, so <clears throat> the thoracic volume increases finally, once there is an increase in vertical volume, so the anteroposterior axis, so it leads to, see, uh, there are two steps. This is vertical volume increases whenever diaphragm becomes flat. And simultaneously, there is external intercostal muscles, they contract. So you can see the arrow mark in which the rib cages are going to expand. So because of the contraction of external internal costal muscles contract, so the ribs and sternum, so the ribs and sternum, they lift up. So volume in dorsoventral axis increases. So this is horizontal volume. 
this is the vertical volume so vertical volume increases because of the contraction of diaphragm so the external internal intercostal muscles they are going to contract and as a result the ribs and sternum are going to lift up so the volume in dorsal ventral axis increases or horizontal volume increases so there is vertical volume increasing as well as horizontal volume increasing so the because of this the thoracic volume increases thoracic pressure decreases this is what is going to happen thoracic volume increases thoracic pressure decreases so the lungs are able to expand and the pulmonary volume increases so the lungs expand and the pulmonary volume increases so the intrapulmonary pressure decreases so that i have already discussed about so air this itself is the reason for air to move from outside into the lungs so this is what is happening during inhalation or inspiration two steps are taking place first one is the diaphragm contracts that is they become straight instead of dome shape they become straight so diaphragm contracts so when diaphragm contracts the vertical volume increases that is the antero posterior axis axis it increases simultaneously the external inter intercostal muscles they are going to contract because of which the ribs and sternum they lift up so the volume in dorsal ventral axis increases so the volume in dorsal ventral axis increases or the horizontal volume increases so there is an increase in vertical volume and horizontal volume so as a result of it the total thoracic volume itself increases and thoracic pressure decreases now the lungs expand once these two steps have taken place the lungs expand and the pulmonary volume increases it is just like a balloon so the lungs expand during the inspiration process and pulmonary volume increases so once the lungs expand and pulmonary volume increases the intrapulmonary pressure decreases so it creates a suction pressure to draw the air from atmosphere into the lungs so the intrapulmonary pressure decreases and air moves from outside into the lungs so this is the mechanism of breathing during inspiration so there is intrapulmonary air pressure decreases and there is a air moving from atmosphere into the lungs so that is going to take place during this inspiration so two steps diaphragm contracts external intercostal muscles also contract so if you write this step wise that itself is sufficient during your examination for the mechanism of breathing during inspiration how it is going to take place so this you have to write okay then during expiration exhalation of air so what are all the changes that is happening in the expiration so the mechanism of expiration so the intercostal muscles and diaphragms they are going to relax both of them contracted during uh, inspiration intake of air during expelling of air or expiration so intercostal muscles and the diaphragm they relax once they relax the horizontal and vertical volume they decreases so thorax regains its original position so the thoracic volume decreases pulmonary volume decreases so it has a squeezing effect on the lungs so the air is expelled out so the air is expelled out because of this process so the intercostal muscles and diaphragms they relax during the expiration process so the thorax regains its original position so as a result of it uh, there is a squeezing mechanism on the lungs so the thoracic volume also decreases thorax regains its original position and the thoracic volume also decreases so once the thoracic volume decreases so it has a squeezing uh, effect i told you about so the pulmonary volume decreases so when the diaphragm relax uh, relax you can notice that they have become dome shaped so the squeezing phenomena from the rib cages as well as the diaphragm so they are squeezing the air out so the pulmonary volume decreases so air moves out from the lungs into the atmosphere so it is expelled out from the lungs into the atmosphere okay so that is what you find during the mechanism of expiration 
Another important point that you have to notice is during forceful expiration, the abdominal muscles and internal intercostal muscles, they contract during forceful expiration. So that is, it is not normal expiration. It is almost like expiratory reserve volume. So during forceful expiration, the abdominal muscles, so you are planning for some ab workout. So forceful expiration, you can have this abdominal muscles and internal intercostal muscles. The internal intercostal muscles, both of them are going to contract. And when you come back to your normal position, they relax. So during forceful expiration, the abdominal muscles and internal intercostal muscles, they contract. So you have to remember about it. So during the forceful expiration, the abdominal muscles and the internal the intercostal muscles, they are going to contract. So that is one point you have to remember about. <clears throat> Next is, the interesting part, especially the vital capacity, total lung capacity, they are going to ask you the definition during the examination. <clears throat> so you should be knowing the different definitions of it. Okay. So the respiratory volumes and capacities. So tidal volume, that is TV. Uh, inspiratory reserve volume, that is forceful inspiration. So we call it as inspiratory reserve volume. Expiratory reserve volume that is forceful expiration or supplemental air so inspiratory reserve volume is complemental air so forceful expiration or uh, expiratory reserve volume uh, or supplemental air we call it as erv irv then residual volume rv inspiratory capacity ic expiratory capacity ec then frc functional residual capacity Vital capacity, VC, total lung capacity, we call it as TLC. So VC is vital capacity, total lung capacity is TLC. So they have asked many times for one mark questions, the vital capacity and total lung capacity definitions. So let us study step by step part of it. So what is tidal volume? See, tidal volume, it defines the air inspired or expired during a normal respiration. Now you are all being seated. You are not running, jogging or doing any exercise. So at this part of time, the air which you inspire, inhale, and the air which you expire. So this is normal respiration. So that they have found it to be uh, that we call it as tidal volume. The volume of air which is inspired or expired during normal respiration, we call it as tidal volume. It is just 500 ml. It is about 500 ml. That is in one minute. So 500 ml, it is there. So in one minute, you have 6,000 to 8,000 ml per minute. That is during normal respiration. Okay. So this we call it as the tidal volume. So the entire this part of it, the shaded region is the tidal volume. So where you notice that it is 500 ml of it. Okay. See here, this is a very beautiful explanation. Vital capacity, it includes, what are all the things that includes vital capacity? ERV, this is vital uh, capacity, VC, Okay, so then it also includes IRV. So ERV plus VC plus IRV, we call it as, so this entire thing, we call it as the vital capacity. Okay, ERV, TV plus IRV, we call it as vital capacity. So if it includes the residual volume and all four of that, we call it as total lung capacity. What is the total lung capacity? Residual volume plus ERV plus VC plus IRV. All this four together, we call it as total lung capacity. 
okay so it, using this graph it is very easy to understand this definition but they have not given it in your textbook so you just go through this so to remember the definition if i have to define vital capacity it is erv expiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume together we call it as vital capacity total lung capacity is residual volume expiratory reserve volume vital capacity inspiratory reserve volume all these four components together we call it as tidal uh, total lung capacity so when now what we are breathing it is tidal volume so it is in normal breathing so whenever we are inspiring or expiring during normal breathing or normal respiration we call it as tidal volume it is about 500 ml so the cr that we take up is 500 ml during ardha liter half liter or 500 ml during this insp uh, inspiration or expiration so in a minute we have 6000 or 8000 ml per minute so that is the intake of air per minute so in a minute we'll be breathing 12 to 14 times so on that basis they have calculated it so it would be 6000 to 8000 ml so in a minute we breathe for 12 to 14 times so you multiply that 12 into 5 it is 6000 14 into 5 you have this 8000 so 6000 to 8000 ml per minute so in a single breathing we are going to take 500 ml so either through inspiration or expiration during normal respiration that we call it as tv or tidal volume so the inspiratory reserve volume or complemental air it is very easy to remember forceful inspiration especially i told you we had a discussion on this pranayama and other isn't it so the forceful inspiration normal inspiration is what we are having now you are doing and a pranayama wherein you take more air than normal respiration so the forceful inspiration that you take or do so that additional volume of air that can inspire by forceful inspiration it is 2500 to 3000 ml so this forceful inspiration can also happen whenever you are running very fastly or doing any exercises so there is forceful inspiration so you should remember about that and that is nearly 2.5 to 3 liters of air so it is 2500 to 3000 ml so during the forceful inspiration so additional volume of air taken that can be inspired by forceful inspiration it is 2.5 to 3 liters okay normal it is 500 now when you are doing pranayama or other breathing exercises so you have a forceful inspiration where you take nearly uh, 2500 to 3000 ml now the forceful expiration we call it as expiratory reserve volume or supplemental air so that is the next definition so the additional volume of air that can be inspired by forceful inspiration we call it as inspiratory reserve volume so the additional volume of air that can be inspired by forceful inspiration we call it as uh complemental air or inspiratory reserve volume it is 2500 to 3000 ml that is 2.5 to 3 liters of air the next one is expiratory reserve volume or supplemental air so the additional volume of air that can expire by a forceful expiration so you are expiring the additional volume of air so that is expelled out by a forceful expiration so sometimes you might be uh, breathing out uh, during the pranayama itself forceful expiration when you make so it leads to the exhalation or expulsion of air into the atmosphere that could be around 1000 to 1100 ml so the forceful expiration of air is 1000 to 1100 ml so we call this erv also as supplemental air irv we call it as complemental air next is rv what is rv so the residual volume so this is the residual volume the volume of air remaining in lungs after a forcible expiration so even after forcible expiration there is certain volume of air within the lungs so we call it as residual volume okay 
So it is 1,100 to 1,200 ml. So nearly one liter of air is there. So 1,100 to 1,200 ml. So the volume of air remaining in lungs, even after forcible expiration, we call it as residual volume. So or we also call it as RV. And it is about 1,100 to 1,200 ml. So the volume of air remaining in lungs even after forcible expiration. So that will be around 1,100 to 1,200 ml. That is RV. Now we are going to discuss about inspiratory capacity and expiratory capacity. So capacity means ability. So the inspiratory capacity, the total volume of air inspired after a normal expiration. So total volume of air inspired after a normal expiration, that is tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume. So together we call it as inspiratory capacity. Tidal volume is normal inspiration or exhalation during uh, respiration, normal respiration. We call it as tidal volume. Inspiratory reserve volume is force additional volume of air taken during the forceful inspiration. That we call it as IRV or complemental air. So whenever we are discussing about inspiratory capacity, it is tidal volume plus IRV and it is nearly three liters, three to three and a half liters. That is 3,000 to 3,500 ml. So what is the, uh, the capacity, inspiratory capacity I see? So the inspiratory capacity is TV plus the IRV, inspiratory reserve volume. So together we call it as inspiration capacity, okay? Next is expiratory capacity. Again, it is TV plus ERV. So total volume of air expired after a normal inspiration. So the total volume of air expired after a normal inspiration, we call it as ERV, that is expiratory capacity. So it is defined by TV plus ERV, okay? So that is what is the normal, uh, expiratory capacity. So next is uh, expiratory capacity it is one and a half to one and a half liter that is 1500 to 1600 ml. So you can easily remember it as EC expiratory capacity equals TV plus ERV. Okay, that is easy for you to remember. Next one is the respiratory volumes and capacity. We have this functional residual capacity. Sometimes they have asked it, expand FRC. FRC is nothing but functional residual capacity. So the volume of air remaining in the lungs after a normal expiration. What is functional residual capacity or FRC? The volume of air which remains in the lung after a normal expiration, okay? So we call it as uh, functional residual capacity. So it is ERV plus residual volume. Expiratory capacity is volume of air expired after a normal inspiration. So that volume of air, we call it as expiratory capacity. Don't can get confused with FRC. What is FRC? It is volume of air remaining in the lungs. It is not volume of air expelled. So volume of air uh, remaining in the lungs after a normal expiration, that is ERV plus RV. So volume of air remaining in the lungs after a normal expiration. So we call it as functional residual capacity. That is, it is 2,100 to 2,300 ml. So the volume of air remaining in the lungs after a, so here you have this FRC, ERV plus RV, we call it as FRC. So this table is very good to understand. Uh, this graph is very good to understand the uh, ERV, uh, FRC, 
all those it is very easy to understand okay so the functional residual capacity is so the volume of air remaining in the lungs which remain in the lungs after a normal expiration that is erv plus rv we call it as frc so it is 2100 to 2300 ml so you have to mark this up there is no other go you have to remember the uh, formulas and the liters what is vital capacity vc okay volume of air that we can breathe in after a forced expiration see the vital capacity is volume of air that can, we can breathe in after a forced expiration or volume of air that we can breathe out after a forced inspiration okay so volume of air that we can breathe in after a forced expiration or volume of air that we can breathe out after a forced inspiration we call it as vital capacity so you are doing a pranayama so forceful inspiration you have done now the volume of air that you can expel out after this forced inspiration so that you can expel out that uh, volume of air that you can breathe in after a forced expiration so that volume of air or volume of air that you can breathe out after a forced inspiration so that we call it as the vital capacity so vital capacity is after forced inspiration if you are going to expel out that air that air is called as vital capacity or after forced inspiration the volume of air that you can breathe out is the uh, vital capacity so it is easy formula uh, the erv plus irv plus tv tidal volume so erv plus tidal volume plus irv that is inspiratory reserve volume expiratory reserve volume tidal volume plus expiratory inspiratory reserve volume it is totally 3.5 to 4.5 liters that is 3500 to 4500 ml that is what is vital capacity so the total lung capacity is 5000 to 6000 ml isn't it so the total lung capacity formula is the rv plus erv plus tv plus irv or you can also write it as vital capacity plus rv so you rv plus residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume so the volume of air in the lungs after a maximum inspiration so the total volume of air in the lungs after a maximum inspiration we call it as total lung capacity that is 5000 to 6000 ml so there is residual volume so it is the air that is present within the lungs after forceful uh, expiration so the volume of air uh, so rv remaining in lungs after a forceful expiration we call it as residual volume so rv plus erv expiratory reserve volume or you can also call it as uh, supplemental air plus insp inspiratory reserve volume or you can also call it as complemental air plus the tv tidal volume that is the normal air that we can breathe in or breathe out uh, during normal respiration so total is 5000 to 6000 ml that is the total lung capacity the total volume of air in the lungs after a maximum inspiration is rv plus erv plus tv plus irv or you can also call it as vital capacity plus residual volume okay they can give numerical problems using this formula so especially in neat or even in uh, your regular paper also they can give this numerical problem using this formula so you should be geared up for that then we had discussed the respiratory volumes and capacity we had also discussed about it so the part of the respiratory tract so from nostrils to terminal bronchi they are not involved in gaseous exchange so this space we call it as dead space so the part of the respiratory tract so from nostrils to the terminal bronchi which are not involved in gaseous exchange we call it as dead space okay the dead air volume is if you fill this dead space with air that volume will be totally 150 ml 
Okay, remember it for one mark and for NEAT or CET, the part of respiratory tract from nostrils to the terminal bronchi, which are not involved in any gaseous exchange, we call it as dead space. The dead air volume is about 150 ml. So you should remember a respiratory cycle involves an inspiration plus an expiration. So the, that is the respiratory cycle. So normal respiratory rate or breathing is 12 to 16 times per minute. So normal respiratory rate is 12 to 16 times per minute. So we had calculated there per minute using this 12 to 16 times per minute. So the normal respiratory rate or breathing rate is 12 to 16 times per minute. So the spirometer or respirometer is an instrument to measure our respiratory rate. What is respiratory rate? So the an inspiration and an expiration together, we call it as the respiratory cycle. So the normal respiratory rate is 12 to 16 minutes per minute. So the normal breathing or normal respiratory rate is 12 to 16 respiratory cycles per minute. Okay, so spirometer or it is also called as respirometer, it is used to measure the respiratory rate. So the spirometer is used to measure the respiratory rate. Then we had discussed about the gaseous exchange. Okay, so gaseous exchange occurs between alveoli and blood, blood and tissues. So between alveoli and blood and blood and tissues. Don't get confused with these diagrams. These are all not required. So just understand the concept. These diagrams are taken up to help you in understanding the concept. Okay. So gaseous exchange occurs between alveoli and blood and blood and tissues. So alveoli, they are the primary sites of gaseous exchange. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged by simple diffusion between the alveoli and uh, the blood. So the, there is exchange of gases by simple diffusion. So the gaseous exchange, the factors which influence the gaseous exchange between the blood and the alveoli are, it depends on the following factors. There should be a pressure gradient or concentration gradient that is from higher concentration to lower concentration, higher pressure to lower pressure. So there should be either a pressure gradient, difference in pressures between the blood and the alveoli, or there should be a difference in concentration. Then solubility of gases also plays an important role in uh, the gaseous exchange. So uh, one more factor which affects the gaseous exchange is solubility of gases. Third one is thickness of membranes. And fourth factor which affects or influences the gaseous exchange is the surface area of respiratory membrane available for gaseous exchange. It should be more. So the surface area of respiratory membrane or lungs, so that is also going to play an important role in gaseous exchange. They should have a larger surface area for more gaseous exchange. So the surface area available for surface area of respiratory membrane or lungs available for gaseous exchange. That is also another factor which influences the gaseous exchange. So these are the four factors which influence the gaseous exchange. The difference between the pressure or difference between concentration, which we call it as pressure gradient or concentration gradient, solubility of gases, then thickness of membranes, surface area of respiratory membrane uh, within the lungs. So they are all the factors which influence the gaseous exchange. So the factors influencing gaseous exchange will be studying about one by one. So the pressure or concentration gradient. So the individual pressure of a gas in a gaseous mixture, we call it as partial pressure. The individual pressure of a gas in a gas mixture is called as partial pressure. Okay, so now uh, there would be a large number of gases in atmospheric air. If I'm going to study the pressure of oxygen, so it is partial pressure of oxygen. The individual pressure of a gas in a gaseous mixture, we call it as partial pressure. Okay, so partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide, that is PO2 
and PCO2, they are given below in this table. You just have to remember this table and you can explain it very easily. What is the partial pressure of uh, one column is partial pressure of oxygen, another in partial pressure of carbon dioxide. They are measured in mm mercury, so millimeters of mercury. So atmospheric air, the PO2 is 159, highest. Okay, in the alveoli, it gets reduced to 104. When it enters into the alveoli, during the process, it gets reduced to 104. So the PO2 in atmosphere is 159, but when it enters into alveoli, it gets reduced to 104. From alveoli, they enter into the uh, oxygenated blood. So they, so 104 is there. And when you look into diffusion taking place, the deoxygenated blood will be just 40. So alveoli, the exchange of oxygen takes place from alveoli to the deoxygenated blood because of difference in this uh, pressure gradient or concentration gradient. So they move by diffusion, oxygen moves into the deoxygenated blood. Okay, so and the deoxygenated blood becomes oxygenated blood, which will be having 95 mm. So they will be having the 95 mm mercury, that is the partial pressure of oxygen. So the P water will be 95. See, atmosphere it was 159. Finally, in the oxygenated blood, it is just 95. So alveoli, this uh, pressure of oxygen would be. 104. Deoxygenated blood is the least because which leads to diffusion and the oxygenated blood will be having only 95 mm of blood. So in the tissues, when it reaches the tissues, the tissues get only around from oxygenated blood, the tissues take this oxygen, so which will be only around 40. So after from the tissues, the uh, deoxygenated blood, so they are going to collect this the oxygen will be just 40 in uh, the tissues. So oxygenated blood and tissues, there is a difference. So there is entry of oxygen from oxygenated blood into the tissues because of this difference, okay? So similarly, so you can notice this. So there is diffusion because of this difference between oxygenated blood and tissues, okay? So now the next aspect is partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Atmospheric pressure, it is very low, 0.3. But in alveoli, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 40. So you can remember uh, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in alveoli is 40. The deoxygenated blood, which is brought to alveoli, they have 45 is their partial uh, PCO2. So since they are higher in deoxygenated blood, diffusion takes place from deoxygenated blood to alveoli. So they lose the carbon dioxide from deoxygenated blood to alveoli. Now the oxygenated blood, so they get oxygenated, isn't it? So they'll be having only uh, 40 mm of PCO2. But when they come to this oxygenated blood, when they come to the tissues, so there is diffusion from the tissues, the carbon dioxide enters into this oxygenated blood and they become deoxygenated blood, which is brought back to the heart. So it's a cyclic process from atmospheric air to alveoli, from alveoli to deoxygenated blood, deoxygenated blood becomes oxygenated blood, oxygenated blood reaches the tissues and from the tissues there is a transfer of gases and uh, that will be collected. So the blood after the transfer of gases from tissues they become deoxygenated blood. So deoxygenated blood will be brought to the alveoli and they are exposed to the atmospheric air. So this is how there is diffusion taking place because of difference of partial pressure of oxygen and partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Okay, this pressure or concentration gradient is responsible for diffusion. This diagram is a very simple diagram to explain it. This is the alveoli, the alveolar here. So what is the partial pressure of oxygen? 104. Carbon dioxide, it is 40. So there is, what about the blood that is brought from the lungs? So this is the heart, this is the alveoli. So the, the blue colored one represents the deoxygenated blood. So deoxygenated blood, they'll be having, so you know the deoxygenated blood value of it. So they'll be having 40 mm of 
uh, oxygen and 45 mm of uh, carbon dioxide. As a result of that, so the oxygen enters from alveoli into the uh, pulmonary artery and carbon dioxide enters from the pulmonary artery into the alveoli. So there is exchange of gases. So once oxygen enters into this deoxygenated blood, they become oxygenated. So oxygenated blood will be having oxygen of 95 mm and they'll be having carbon dioxide of 40 mm. So this oxygenated blood is brought to the heart. They are pumped to the entire part of the body. So the oxygenated blood, when they reach the tissues, so body tissues, you should understand, there is uh, body tissues have oxygen of 40 and carbon dioxide of 45 mm. So there is diffusion from 95 mm, the uh, oxygen enters into 40 mm. So there is diffusion and from 45 mm, the carbon dioxide is going to enter into the blood because of difference of the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So here it is 45 in the blood, it is 40. So there's diffusion. So the oxygenated blood after the exchange of gases in tissues, they become deoxygenated blood. That is why I was uh, telling you about how the circulatory system and the respiratory system are interlinked in the uh, purification of blood okay that is in oxygenation of blood so this diagram you can draw it even during examination and explain it a simple diagram to explain the exchange of gases because of pressure concentration gradient when you are writing it in exam you can write this table also so the respiratory gas i'll be uploading this pdfs of it uh, by today okay so you need not have to worry. By today, the digestion as well as the respiration, I'll be uploading it. So this is the description. So with this, if you have the diagram, you can easily describe that. So the partial pressure of oxygen in alveoli is 104 mm. Then that in the blood capillaries, which is 40 mm and carbon dioxide is 45 mm, here it is 40. So there is entry of oxygen and exit of oxygen from the blood capillaries. So partial pressure of carbon dioxide in deoxygenated blood is more, that is uh, 45, uh, whereas the oxygenated uh, oxygen part is very less, 40 mm, okay? So carbon dioxide diffuses to alveolus. So that is what you find. So there is a difference of partial pressure of oxygen in alveoli 104 and here it is 45. So there is oxygen diffuses into capillary bud. So partial pressure of carbon dioxide is more in this capillary than the alveoli. So they exit out from the blood. So carbon dioxide diffuses to alveoli. And the second aspect of it, solubility of gases. So the solubility of carbon dioxide is 20 to 25 times higher than that of saw oxygen. So the amount of carbon dioxide that can diffuse through the diffusion membrane per unit. So the solubility of carbon dioxide is very high when compared to oxygen. So the amount of carbon dioxide can, that can diffuse through diffusion uh, membrane per unit uh, difference in partial pressure is much higher than that of oxygen. Here they have shown that with example. So the solubility of carbon dioxide is, see this is partial pressure of oxygen and the oxygen solubility rate, it is just 0.15 micromole per liter. But if you look into the uh, solubility of carbon dioxide, it would be three micromole per liter. So it is at least 20 to 25 times higher than that of uh, solubility of oxygen. So the solubility of carbon dioxide per unit membrane, membrane per unit is much higher than that of oxygen. Okay, so you can see that it is three micromole per liter, whereas oxygen is just 0.15 uh, solubility. That is what is their micromole per liter. So it is 20 to 25 times carbon dioxide solubility of carbon dioxide is 20 to 25 times higher than that the solubility of oxygen. So the amount of carbon dioxide that can diffuse through a diffusion membrane per unit, so is different 
difference in partial pressure is much higher than that of oxygen. So the next factor which affects the gaseous exchange is you know, the thickness of membrane. Thickness of membrane is very uh, small. It is total thickness is just 0.5 micron meter. So diffusion membrane is made up of three layers. So the squamous epithelium, basement substance, which is found in between the uh, between this squamous and endothelium. Endothelium is the squamous epithelium lining the inner blood vessels, we call it as endothelium. So the diffusion membrane is made up of three layers, squamous epithelium and endothelium. And in between the squamous epithelium and endothelium is this basement substance. So this is what you have to remember. Squamous epithelium of alveoli, endothelium of uh, capillaries, alveolar capillaries, then basement substance found in between the squamous and uh, endothelium. So they are just 0.5 micron meter. So the thickness of this uh, membrane is 0.5 micron meter. So it easily enables gaseous exchange. It is very less thickness. So the surface area of respiratory membrane, if you are going to a uh, human lung surface area, if you are going to spread it out, it is equivalent to a tennis court. So that is the vastness of the surface area which is available for respiration. So the surface area of respiratory membrane, human lung is equal to a tennis court. So the presence of alveoli within the lungs, they increase the surface area of lung. Thus there is an increase in gaseous exchange. So the surface area is the presence of alveoli within the lungs, they increase the surface area. If you spread out all those surface area of alveoli, it is equivalent to a tennis court, okay? So the larger the surface area, more the gaseous exchange takes place. So that is the fourth factor which affects the uh, gaseous exchange. So next we will be discussing the gas transport in the next class. So I'll be winding up with the second part of the summary of this chapter okay so the gaseous transport that we will be winding up in the next session